So very good to be with you again this morning. I'm doing something very different, and it's actually something I've not done before. So this may descend into total chaos. We'll see. I have, over the years, collected some examples of curious wave phenomena, and I'm going to talk about them. And I'll be doing a little bit of teaching around what I think is the physics behind these wave phenomena. So you learn a bit of physics. Maybe you've done it already, maybe you haven't. Uh, whether it explains the wave phenomena, we'll see. And the last one, I cannot understand. So this is not anything like a test. If I put a question to you, please discuss with your neighbor, with your group. You don't have to solve it on your own. Um, and often bouncing ideas off other people is a very good way for both of you to learn. So we'll see how we go. So I'm going to talk first of all about sea waves, waves at sea. I'm also going to talk about net curtains, umbrellas. I've actually dropped the car windscreen. And I'm going to talk a bit about sound waves. So lots of different kinds of waves. And the first one is C. But I have to teach you or check out that you already know a little bit of physics. Uh, I don't know if any of you already recognize that title. Some of you do. How many of you think you've maybe learned a bit about this? Oh, right. Okay. That's probably about half of you. I will go through it for the other half and also as revision for those of you who've done a bit about it already. And the story is this. We have coming from, let's say, a light on the left, um, single color waves, monochromatic waves. And they come up against a big screen or a wall that's just got a couple of slots, slits in it. And as the waves go through these little slits, they fan out into these semicircular patterns, similarly for this one. The lines mark the crests of waves. And you'll see that there are some places where crests intersect, like there, or there, or there, or there. And where wave crests intersect, you've got a lot of light, because this is a light wave we're talking about. And one of the very neat things is that the intersections of the crests themselves lie on lines. So there's one, two, three intersections on this line, one, two, three, four on this line, none in between, uh, five I think it is on this line, four again, three again. And so if we have here a wall, a screen, a board, which again you're looking at edge on, you get bright light here and here and here and here and here. And if you could see it face on, it would look like this. So there are places where there's lots of light and places in between where there's no light. This is, I think, a lovely example, which I put in just for the fun of it. This is an aerial photograph of a little bit of coast, uh, land here, some more land here, sea waves coming along, and then through the gap, they form this lovely set of semicircular arcs, like I was using here. So to go back to our case, We'll need to get a formula. So here's two beams coming through the two slots. In this particular case, the wave crests are lined up, the wave troughs are lined up, the waves add. And that's one of the directions where you'll get a bright fringe. In this case, uh, peak is against trough, or is in antiphase, and you get nothing here because the two waves cancel each other out. So this is a dark spot. And what we need to do is to check out 
the extra distance that the lower wave is going. So here are the two waves again, slit one, slit two, uh, and the beam's heading off, and the lower beam does this extra distance. And if that's a whole wavelength, or several whole wavelengths, then you get peak lined up with peak, and you get a bright fringe. So you get a bright fringe when this quantity delta is a whole number of wavelengths. But if d is the separation of the slits, this length is d sine theta. And that theta is the same as this theta. It's the direction the beam is going in. Are we okay so far? Great. Okay, so crucial formula to hang on to. Right, we're now going to go on holiday, on vacation. We're going to the beach. A beach in northern Europe. So in high technicolor, here's Europe. This is Britain, France, Spain. This is the north of Africa. That's Italy, which has a good recognizable shape. Scandinavia, Iceland. And we're going to this little bit which I blow up. It's where France joined Spain, the border. That's the border. France above, Spain below. And incidentally, a tiny little European country called Andorra in there. This is very, very mountainous. This is Pyrenees Mountains. And we're just on the Spanish side. Now, in Spain, as in many countries, there are some minority groupings. And in this area of Spain, which is blown up here, there's a grouping called the Basque. And they like their own traditions, their own language, their own holidays, their own festivals, anything to show they're different. And they give different names to the places. So there's a town here, which the Spanish call San Sebastian, and which the Basques call Donostia. It's the same place, just two names for the same place. And we're going to go to the beach there. It's lovely. So this is the town of Donostia or San Sebastian, a lovely shell-shaped round beach, a big headland there, photographs taken from the headland on the other side, and there's a little island in between the two. Clearly there's some very hard rock runs along here, which the sea did breach, but got high land there, high land there, and the island's quite cliffy as well. So, very nice. There's something a little curious about the beach. Um, you can see wet sand, dry sand, wet sand, dry sand, wet sand, dry sand. And you see the boundary between wet and dry is very, very wavy. I've not seen this anywhere else, I must admit. And... What is actually happening is there are ridges and troughs on the beach. And where there's a trough, the sea comes further in. And where there's a ridge, it doesn't come so far in. And when the light's right, you can actually see these ridges. So there's one, another, 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 so on. So there are places on that beach where there are, where there's extra sand a ridge. And the question is, what's causing that? I have not seen it anywhere else, I must admit. There could be places, but what's causing it? What's going on here? Take a moment to talk amongst yourselves, share any ideas you might have. Remember where I started this lecture? Okay, do we have 
Any thoughts? I see some hand waving that looks promising. Yes, somebody with a hand up for quite a while. Yep, between the two headlands. You're almost there. The island's important. You're 99% you're of the way there. Yeah, very good. Um, can anybody modify that just slightly? Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Say it louder. No, come there. Waves can also deposit, actually. So it, but yes, yep. Right, we're, we're just about there. The way I would describe it is saying the island in the middle means that you've got two entrances to the bay, two slits. They're rather wide slits, but you've got two slits. And so, uh, go back to this. So you've got one set of waves coming to the left-hand side of the island, one set of waves to the right-hand side of the island, and in places, at some angles, you get constructive interference, and at some places, you get destructive interference and no waves. And generally speaking, uh, if you do any geology, things get deposited, dropped out of water, the stiller the water is. The rougher the water, the bigger things get carried along. Well, everything gets carried along. The slower the water, only the smaller things get carried along. So where there's extra sand, it probably means there was stiller water, which probably means destructive interference. But it doesn't actually matter you know, which, whether a ridge corresponds to destructive or constructive, um, it's the spacing of these ridges and troughs. Right. Now, when you think you've discovered something, sorted something out, it's always a good idea if you can check it out numerically some way. So what I'd like you to see if you can do is, let's assume this picture's right, if it's right, we've got some formulae, and you should be able to make an estimate of the wavelength of the waves. So do you think you could find the wavelength of sea waves? And I'll keep flicking through slides. Um, this one in particular, do you see there's a size bar, 300 meters? So, for instance, you can get the separation of the slits and the distance to the beach from the graph. I'll keep the slides moving round. I think the other information you're going to need is the separation of the fringes, whatever they are. And this is a really crude piece of estimation. Um, there's a fence and some lamp posts. We are estimating, this is not accurate, this is ballpark figures. Um, interestingly here, there's a shadow of the fence and some lamp posts, and I think probably somebody standing by the fence and maybe some litter bins or something. But with luck from these various slides, you can get a rough value of the sizes of things and see if you come up with something sensible for the wavelength of sea waves. So I will keep flicking through slides. Ah, this is getting really serious with the ruler, yes. 
<laughs> Do you think they've had long enough? I think so. There's some, obviously some very good ideas. There's a few answers they've come up with. Yes. Okay, let's put people out of their misery. From the estimates I've seen so far, you're doing really, really well. How many of you have been to the seaside and seen sea waves? Okay. What do you think is a sensible answer for the wavelength of sea waves? Five meters? Ish? This is all ish, yes? Six-ish? Yep. I've, somebody, I think, had four. It all sounds about right if you think of the waves you see at the seaside. So we're probably on the right tracks. But let me just talk you through it a little bit more. So, um, we've already identified the waves come either side of the island. We've got two slits, the waves come out, and there's a number of fringes on the beach. Am I going the wrong way? That doesn't seem right. Okay. So one of the things we've got to get is the separation of the slits. Normally they're very narrow, and that's easy, but here they're wide. And what you've got to get is either center of slit to center of slit, or maybe right-hand edge of slit to right-hand edge of slit, or left-hand edge to left-hand edge. And using this 300-meter bar, I estimated that the slit separation was about 600 meters, give or take. Okay. Um, I also wanted the distance between the slits and the screen, which is the beach, and I estimated that as 900 meters. And the more tricky thing was working out the separation of the fringes on the beach, the separation of the ridges. And um, one way of doing it is saying, this is a bit of the fence, the railing. It's probably about a meter high. And so you can sort of guess, sort of guess how far apart these ridges are. Did other people have other ways of estimating? Yes? Ah. Right. Right. Good. Yes. Got another way, sir? You used the what? Sorry, the. Yes. Yep. That d sine theta equals n lambda, um, you end up with an angle, and as well as the angle, you need to know the distance to the beach, and the separation on the beach. So you've you've got three things there, and you need two of them to get the third. We've probably all done it by slightly different methods, but, yep. Okay, um, so my estimate of the fringe spacing on the beach was six meters, but, you know, it's an estimate. As long as you didn't say 60 meters or six centimeters, you know, easily done, but not real. And so my estimate of the wavelength of sea waves came out as four meters but I'm hearing others that are very much in the same sort of ballpark. It is a crude estimate because actually the wavelength of sea waves depends on the depth of the water. And here we have a beach, so the depth is continually changing. So this is really crude stuff. It's not sophisticated. But it is an important skill to have to check out a hypothesis, which is why I put it in, besides being a rather curious effect on the beach, which I have not seen anywhere else. And just a little back story. Um, I work at the University of Oxford, 
one of the most prestigious universities in Oxford. At the beginning of each academic year, we have an event for the new graduate students. These are people who have finished their degrees, first degrees, and are starting research doctorates. And it involves all the academic staff and all the graduate students. And I showed them these slides and said, what do you think's going on? And there was a stunned silence. One first year grad student got the right answer. None of the others, professors and lecturers. And so you've done really well. Congratulations. That was with two slits. You can have things with lots and lots of slits, diffraction gratings, for instance, and they perform just the same way, and you do the same kind of sums about working out the path difference between adjacent rays using the distance between the slits and the angle. So same stuff, just a bit more repetitive. And you can get the same effect in two dimensions. So you can have slits and slits. And it comes from a mesh. So actually your slits are little square holes, but it's the same idea. Um, so any kind of woven fabric, <coughs> loosely woven fabric, is like a mesh. Not obviously loosely wo woven is your umbrella. Your umbrella is some fabric. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's night time, it's raining a bit, you have the umbrella up, and it's windy, so you're holding the umbrella like this. And you notice that a distant street light can be seen through the umbrella and looks something a bit like this. And this pattern is because of the mesh, the woven material that your umbrella is made of. And it's like two sets of multiple slits. <coughs> you can't see the individual fringes. They've become blurred, but there are actually, or there should be individual fringes here and individual fringes here, but they have become a bit blurred. But that cross shape is basically the same physics again with the street light seen through your umbrella. The Brits are very keen on having net curtains at their windows. I don't know if representatives of other countries here have net curtains at their windows. Do you know what I'm on about? <laughs> here on the left is a photograph this is actually taken in Ireland where they have net curtains as well it's a photograph taken from inside looking out through a net curtain there's a tree here it's probably a birch tree because it's got a nice white bark and there's lots of green leaves around I think these browny things are actually in the room <coughs> And there's a funny little pattern there, because out there, there is a car parked. It's a nice, clean, shiny car, and it's a sunny day, and the sunlight is bouncing off the car. So out there is a very, very bright light, where the sun is shining off a bit of the curved surface of the car. And the light comes through the net curtain, and makes a little pattern. And this is the same pattern, the same photograph, blown up. And uh, you don't see the individual spots on that line, but you can see all the individual spots here and across here. And this is done with white light, so there are all the colors present. And we have lots of nice little rainbows so I want you to stop and think a moment. Why have we got rainbows? And are the rainbows in the right 
order, the right layout, so to speak. Do you remember the formula you've been using? <coughs> D sine theta equals N lambda. So there's a relationship between lambda and theta. Absolutely right. Could other people hear her? No. Okay. She's working with the formula d sine theta equals n lambda. The d is the spacing of the net curtain mesh. So we've got a relationship between sine theta and lambda. Now, red wavelength light, is that long wavelength or short wavelength? long. So if sine theta is proportional to lambda, what's that do to theta? Increases it. And so sine theta is bigger, so what is theta itself, bigger or smaller? It's bigger. Yep. So the red has the long wavelength and it's got a bigger theta. It's further spread from the zero point. And similarly for the other wavelengths. Right, sound waves. Uh, I've got a little bit of data here. I know some of you have been photographing some of the slides. You might find it handy to photograph the data because we'll be doing some sums. If you've got a phone handy, if you haven't, don't worry. We can flip back the slides. And we're going to go to Mexico for this one. No, we're not. I've forgotten. Okay, I'm a small child. I'm playing on the floor and I go, meow. Meow. What am I doing? What's this I'm holding? It's a toy car. And the sound. Meow. Mm. Starts with a high frequency. Ow. Oh. Anybody know the name of this phenomenon? Doppler, Doppler effect. effect, yes. So a five year old knows about Doppler effect, actually. When the car is coming towards you, the waves get more compressed, higher frequency. When the car is moving away from you, the waves get more stretched out, lower frequency. Good. Right, now we're going to Mexico. We're going to one of the ancient Mayan pyramids in Mexico. This is it. Do you see a person there, just to give you an idea of scale? And I think there's another person here. It's big. And I don't think we really know why the Mayans built these. Other similar cultures did as well. Um, there are these major big layers, and there are flights of steps up each face. And this is a picture of one of the flights of steps. And it looks fairly ordinary. There is a historic tradition that the ancient Mayan priests could evoke the Quetzal bird. It's now extinct, but it used to be their holy bird. He, the Mayan priest could evoke the sound of the Quetzal bird. This is impossible to check out because it's extinct, so we don't know what the sound was. 
but you can get some funny, curious sound effects from flights of steps like this. And it's a little complicated to explain, but it involves the priest standing in front of the steps and doing a hand clap. A hand clap is a very short, sharp pulse of sound, and it's got quite a range of frequencies in it as well. So what happens if you clap your hands in front of a flight of steps? <laughs> yes, don't do it by your neighbour's ear, it's not fair. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether it would work with the steps up to here. Um, the flight is actually broken into two flights. But So, this particular staircase at the Mayan Pyramid has 91 steps, and the whole staircase is 24 metres high. So that means the steps, individual steps, are about 25 centimetres high and they look as if they're as far back as they are high. Now, when you clap your hands, you get this very short, sharp pulse. And I first of all thought, this is to do with the frequencies in the hand clap. Actually, it's not. It's more clever. It's to do with the propagation and reflection of a very short, sharp pulse. So that signal, I could probably demonstrate it here. This signal sets off in this direction. It hits the first riser and bounces back. It hits the second riser and bounces back. It hits the third riser and bounces back, and so on, all the way up the flight of stairs. So, the Mayan hoi polloi, standing behind the priest, here a reflection, and a little bit later another one, and another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, at equally spaced intervals. And it's these pulses at equally spaced intervals that are almost themselves a sine wave, are almost themselves a single note. So for this particular case, I'd like you to see if you can work out with 25 centimetre wide steps, what's the gap between subsequent reflected pulses? And now could you turn that string of pulses into a frequency of the sound? Have you had long enough agony? So the steps are 25 centimetres deep, which means each wave travels an extra 50 centimetres out and back, which is half a metre. The speed of sound is 343 metres per second, so it does half a metre in that number of seconds, which is very close to that number of seconds, or 700 hertz. So that string of repeated pulses is like a 700 hertz sound note. Is that in the audible range? Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether it would work on the steps outside. It only occurred to me this morning as I was walking in. I wonder if it would work there. Um, you don't have that many steps, unfortunately. I think you probably need quite a long string of them to get a proper note. But that's, we believe, what that flight of steps were. And the famous holy Quetzal bird apparently made a note at about 700 hertz, if you believe the whole story. We just honestly don't know. Are there any questions around that item? Or any others we've done so far? Are we okay? Right.
Finally, something I cannot understand. I have so far failed to understand. We are back in Europe. We are on the river Danube. We are in a country called Austria. Doesn't much matter what the country is. We are close to a little town called Dürnstein. Um, there's a nice little bit of British history here. So, for the Brits, there's a ruined castle up here. And it's famous because of somebody who was imprisoned there. The year is 1190 something, 93, 94, 92, something like that. And the then King of England, known as Richard the Lionheart, has unfortunately got himself captured and imprisoned in a castle somewhere in Central Europe. He has a musician from his court, a troubadour or a minstrel. His name is Blondel. And Blondel decides he's going to work out which castle Richard the Lionheart is imprisoned in. Blondel and Richard, before all this happened, together made up a song. And what Blondel does is he goes to every flipping castle, there were a lot, and sings the first verse of this song, which only he and Richard know. When he gets to this castle and sings the first verse, Richard seems, sings back the second verse from the dungeon. And so Blondel knows now where Richard is. They can then know who's the Lord in charge of all this, and they can arrange for Richard to be released for a ransom. This happens. The ransom was a whopping 15 tons of silver. It was probably about 25% of all the resources of England. It was huge. And it was so huge they had to set up the mint in Austria. So it's the origins of the Austrian mint. So that's the castle, the ruined castle now, where Richard the Lionheart was imprisoned. And um, this comes from a book by Patrick Lee Furbor called A Time of Gifts. He walks all the way from Britain to Budapest or somewhere like that. And this is incidents along his journey. So he's visited the castle and he's then somewhere on the riverbank. He doesn't say where. Uh, just go back one thing. I think he's talking about this cliff, but it's not completely clear. The cliff possesses an acoustic foible which I've never met anywhere else. I remembered it standing in the same place and hearing it again three decades later. Good. There are two observations. The observation has been repeated. It's not a one-off. A tug with a string of barges and a flag that was unidentifiable in the failing light was creeping upstream against the press of the current. When its siren sounded... After a delay of three seconds, the long drawn out boom was joined by an echo from the cliff, which was exactly an octave higher, forming a chord. And when the lower note ended, the higher outlived it solo for another three seconds and died away. This is a curious kind of echo three seconds delay. If it hadn't had three seconds delay, that would have been okay. Um, three seconds in terms of sound is how long? How far? It's about a kilometer in round terms. Yep, 1k. So the higher note has gone 1k before it reached him. It's all very puzzling. I have lots of photographs of this bit around Dernstein to try and understand what's going on. We don't know where he was standing. He says he's somewhere on the riverbank. Um, and although there's quite a lot of high ground, this is a, a rather obvious cliff 
So that's probably the cliff he's talking about. Uh, this is looking across the other side of the river. It's pretty flat. I don't think the trouble's coming from there. Uh, this is another view. There's the village. There's the cliff. That's the castle. Uh, this is from way upstream looking down towards Dernstein. I think Dernstein is there. I think that's the cliff and the castle will be somewhere up there. There's actually quite a lot of high ground here, cliffs and valleys. And that's as much sense as I can make of it. Any ideas? Now or in the future? <laughs> yes? How high is the cliff? Uh, um, well, let's see. In terms of the church tower, it's probably five or six church towers. If you imagine the church tower moved over there. And the church tower is probably three or four floors high. It's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? I mean, maybe he's imagined the whole thing, but he says he's seen it twice, heard it twice. Some years apart. Yeah. Yeah, the three seconds is probably very subjective. That's a fair point. But presumably there's some delay. So did you hear that further back? Two separate barges? Uh, with different sirens that happened to fire at just slightly different times. The snag is he's heard this twice on two, I mean, two separate occasions, 30 years apart. So it's a bit of a coincidence just to have. <laughs> yeah. Aha. Sort of here's me and here's me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> you should be able to. The river's pretty wide. Um, and he doesn't normally work, walk at night, so I think it's daytime. But, yeah. Yes. The snag is the cliffs are all on the same side. Oh, whoops. There's, there's quite a few cliffs here. I, I did wonder if somehow the sound had rattled around one of these valleys and then came out three seconds later. But why does it come out an octave higher? Mm -hmm. Sorry, when, what happened? Its frequency is doubled, yes. So maybe there's some Yeah. The cliff, the cliff, is actually slightly slanty. You see it's slanting back. <laughs> well, I'm very relieved that nobody said, obviously it's such and such, and left me feeling a fool, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> I think I'm going to call a halt at that point and just see if there are any questions about anything. Yep. Yeah. So we've got a question over here. Well, I think before we do questions, I think we have to give that a, a round of applause. <laughs> You're not getting away without that. 